Okay, hope everybody's filling in. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Good to see everybody. Or at least some of you are using this as your lunch hour, and hopefully uh, this will be a good way to spend that time. Thanks for spending it with us. As you're all coming on in, and while we're waiting for our uh, last attendees to arrive, put in the chat where you're joining us from. We'd love to see, we know that our clients and all of you across the country are joining us. We'd love to see where you're coming from. Great, look at that from all over. I'm glad to see some of the people in the uh, Minneapolis area in the Midwest have power. That's a good thing. I know not everybody does. So hopefully you uh, dodge the storms. See a few names I recognize, great. A Terps, go Terps. Love to see that. Three Terps in my family, including me. And just so you all know, I'm in Maryland, Dennis is down in Texas, and Kara's in Florida. All right. All right. So let's get started. People will continue to, to pile in. Uh, my name is Jan Weinberg Wood. I am the Senior Managing Vice President uh, for BWF. Thrilled that you all are here today and appreciate you giving us an hour of your time. We're going to make sure it's worthwhile. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things you're going to see down on the bottom of your screen, a Q&A box. We want to hear your questions. We want to really spend some time at the end really addressing those. Please put your questions in there and then we'll get to those at the end. Uh, you will have heard that we are recording this session. And um, just so you know, you will get a copy of that recording. You will also get a list of all of the sources we used for our research and data. And then you'll get a link to a really exciting, interesting um, thought leadership article uh, with a DEI focus that helps give guidance to data governance and building a really inclusive database, which certainly ties into some of the things we'll talk about here today. So you'll receive all of that sometime this week, as well as a survey for follow-up, we really do want your feedback. I'd like to introduce my partners in crime today. We've got Dennis Pres Prescott, who's our Senior Vice President, and Kara Wagner, who's our Associate Vice President, and we have been um, excited to bring this information to you. So as we move forward, we're going to give you a historical perspective, then really some overview of what's happening today, really then start to dig into the motivations and engagement. Um, and then the, the most important part, how do we take all of this knowledge and all of this data and turn it into action that grows your philanthropy in your respective institutions um, in a really meaningful and impactful way? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kara. Thanks, Jan. So as Jan said, I'm Kara Wagner. And before we really dive into the power of women in philanthropy today, it's really important that we actually start from a historical perspective. You will note throughout today, you're going to learn how many of today's women are really showcasing their philanthropy, much in the same way as the women who started it all, even as early as the 1600s. But we know that many of you who have joined us today are expecting to hear about Mackenzie Scott and Melinda French Gates, they are two very important women who are playing such an important role today. But before they were front and center, we actually had women who still continue to have a blasting legacy even today, 
And I'm gonna point out a few of those, first starting with Mary Elizabeth Garrett. So anyone who has heard of Johns Hopkins Medical School, which means all of you actually have Mary Elizabeth Garrett to thank for that. Mary Elizabeth's philanthropy is what actually opened that school before they had the funding. And the funding had stalled, which means progress had stalled. And she came in and she said, not only will I give you my, my dollars, but you will also admit women into your medical school. So not only did she support, but she also made change. And that's really what you're going to see today is women who are those C changes and really those change makers, including women of color like Madam C.J. Walker. And I know many of you actually are familiar with, with Madam C.J. Walker because her name is on many things in the South due to her generosity. And her generosity stemmed from something quite interesting, which is she was an entrepreneurial of her time. And that entrepreneurial nature led her to creating a hair care product line specifically for African-American women. And then she used those funds to pay for changes that she felt passionately about and use that philanthropy for good. So as we dive into what did this look like back when it very first started, I will tell you it really has been rooted in the role of a woman. And women's work was often seen as being the caretaker, the comforter, and not surprisingly, that's also where philanthropy was really rooted. And taking the role of woman as care provider and comforter, not only did it position women well to be those, those charitable people who were driving change, but men were also supportive of it because there was that caretaker role and that acceptance. But we also see that over the last 250 years, as early as the 1700s, we started seeing a bifurcation. That bifurcation was really because of women of color no longer seeing themselves represented in some of the philanthropic initiatives that were being led at the time. And it started to become philanthropy was associated with social status, high society. But women of color who were not permitted to be in those roles often, they really said, we want to continue to see change to the communities and people that we care about. So they really started banding together. And it actually really started to get into the giving circles. I know many of you have heard of giving circles, may even have giving circles at your institution. But giving circles were really rooted in not only the, the desire to be a change maker, but also in the desire to pool funds and make some of that community involvement a part of philanthropic change by allowing women to band their funds together, but also their passions and make those decisions as a group of women who really were able to step up and make that change. But interestingly enough, the giving circles were a very important cornerstone of that change. And even the term circles, if you think about what a circle is, it is continuous, non-hierarchical. This inclusivity was important even in the nomenclature and the words that they used because they were really putting their money where their mouth is. And, and making that change, but they wanted it to be something that was rooted in exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to show the world the power of women and the power to make that change. I'm going to put a spotlight on Alpha Kappa Alpha, and it's important that we're highlighting them as our, our spotlight when it comes to giving circles, because you're going to learn that Alpha Kappa Alpha, Alpha was one of the very first giving circles, but they were the first. African American people of color sorority. And it started at Howard University all the way back in 1908. That 1908 is important because as you can imagine at that turn of the century, it also meant that women were starting to be seen differently. So banding together as part of a sorority gave them the platform to begin giving back. And be, it really started as tuition assistance, housing assistance for the people of the sorority. 
and grew over time. They started to put themselves in the civil rights movement. They started, they really were supporting organizations and women and men of color, all those of marginalized communities, because they understood the power of philanthropy. And it's interesting because women that you all know, including we have uh, some women today that, that you know very well, including Alicia Keys and Wanda Sykes and Kamala Harris, but also some women that you've heard of that were real change makers and a part of what it is that you see today as equality and, and helping those marginalized communities, including Coretta Scott King, who we all know, the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King. We also have Rosa Parks, the civil rights activist of the time, all came from this generous Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority that gave the platform to move forward and move forward women's initiatives. But as this was happening, the world around it was changing. And 50 years ago, there was a larger presence. We started to see women having more visibility in our community, including on leadership and governing boards. And as they started to be even more visible in both the boardroom as a CEO and on that corporate landscape, the philanthropy followed. And as they took on more leadership roles and really were able to break the glass ceiling, along with it came the power of bringing the purse and being more visible also inspired other women. And it really became important that nonprofits, even back then, started to realize women are making these decisions, women are pushing forward the changes that they want to see, therefore we need to react, we need to include, we need to think about how are they being able to be a player in a way that they had never seen before. And those changes are still in effect today. We are still seeing that shift. And Dennis is gonna lead us into what does that shift look like? Where are women today? And really looking at the ways that even back as early as the 1800s, how does philanthropy look the same and how does it look different? Dennis? Thank you, Kara. Hello, everybody. So as you've seen so far from Kara's remarks, uh, women's influence has been around in philanthropy for a long, long time. And it's even continuing to increase the influence and the power. So it's important to understand that as organizations and develop strategies to, to, to make that our strategies and outcomes the most effective. And so what we're gonna see and talk about in the next few slides are several things because studies reveal that women contribute more generously than men. They approach giving with distinct priorities and methods and they play a central role in household giving decisions. So you see here from this slide, an estimated 85% of affluent household charitable giving decisions are made by or influenced by women. So women are already controlling much of the wealth and they're driving change through, through their economic influence and philanthropy more than they ever have. Uh, so that means that, that nonprofits that strategically and intentionally engage women by, by focusing on the things that are most important to women are going to have uh, logically the most success. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time talking about time, talent, and treasure, but the research continues to show that significantly more women than men spend time volunteering, and we know that those who volunteer tend more tend to give more, so that's really important to, to keep in mind. Uh, but there's a new push uh, for impactful giving as women philanthropists as they seek to gain a better understanding about the work being done in these organizations. So, you know, you hear phrases like trust-based philanthropy. That seems to be a really key thing for, for these women philanthropists and, and things that are on their mind uh, a great deal. So we spent a lot of time the last few years, really a long time now, talking about the great wealth transfer. And most of you know what that means, but in case you don't, what we're, what we're talking about the great wealth transfer, it's used to describe the transfer of wealth from the baby boomer and the silent generation to their children and grandchildren over the next 20 years or so with the majority of assets being transferred to women. So I know there's a lot on this slide, so maybe we should just, should just take it line by line and, and let it soak in a minute. Uh, so thanks to that wealth, great wealth transfer, women are gonna control even more uh, wealth than they already do. Uh, 
we currently think that about a third of the world's wealth is, is estimated to be held by women. And more importantly for this audience, probably half of this is in, is in the United States. Uh, it's estimated that women are responsible for 35 trillion in assets, more of a third of the, all the wealth in North America. So let that sink in for a minute. Um, you see there that 70% of the affluent household assets are controlled by baby, baby boomers, boomers and 84 trillion. That number moves around a lot, but the, that's the number we're going with today. Uh, that we estimate that 84 trillion is expected to be transferred uh, through 2045 as these estates are being realized. And, uh, and importantly, 30 trillion is expected to be transferred from baby boomer men to women. Uh, because women tend to live longer than men, right? So those are just all uh, really important things to think about. Now let's talk about next about decision making. Um, you see here from the pie chart that uh, not quite two thirds the decisions are made jointly. Only twelve point one of the percent the man solely decides. So even when if, if it's a single decision, the women are making more of those decisions solely than, than men and 11% decide uh, separately. So um, these are just important things to keep in mind uh, as, as we think about things like recruiting volunteers for our campaigns and our boards. Um, we're starting to see, whereas before, uh, organizations might have recruited uh, males who happen to be on their boards or who may, might often have been associated with making bigger gifts. We're starting to see now organizations have a great deal of success and smartly so recruiting couples to be uh, on their volunteer boards. Uh, I had a client, a uh, public university client a few years back that they exclusively recruited couples to their campaign steering committee and it was a, it was a huge success for them. More about the uh, the charitable decision making, and and this isn't this isn't a perfect science, but you see what the decision making style tendencies are when a man decides. More likely among younger households, uh, more attending religious service more frequently, uh, and more likely when the husband has more education than the wife. The flip side of that is when it's the woman decides. More likely the wife has more education than the husband. Uh, when it when it's jointly. Uh, that's more likely among older households and with uh, children under 18. Uh, and some similarities there when they separately decide, uh, uh, you see what, what's uh, in place there. And, and it's worth pointing out that uh, in certain cultures, I won't call any of them out, but you probably encounter some of this on your own. Uh, it's in certain cultures, it's particularly true that the woman is either making the decision or maybe while not in the foreground, that person, that woman is making decisions or heavily influencing uh, decisions about giving in the background. And Dennis, I, I will add one more because we know that most donors do not start their giving at a major principal or transformational level of gift. And we know that all of the research shows that those who make that sole decision it's typically on smaller gifts. As the gift size increases, there is more power of partnership in that gift making decision. So as Dennis said, in ensuring that you are involving both spouses, even at the early stages, will help set up the likelihood for success because a spouse has been involved since the very first smaller gifts. And that's really going to open up your pipeline for those larger gifts because you've included both spouses along the way. Thank you, Kara. And that brings us back to giving circles today. Uh, Kara shared the history of them, but uh, it's worth talking about, about them today uh, as well, because we've seen a resurgence of them in the last decade, especially with uh, this push toward trust-based philanthropy and participatory grant making. Uh, so they, so we, we've seen a resurgence. Um, there was a study that showed there were more than 4,000 of these giving circles across the U.S., and they contributed over $3 billion between 2017 and 2023, and most of these groups are made up of women. 
Uh, it's estimated uh, by another report that one in five giving circles have designated their giving explicitly to promote gender equity and justice. And so that's allowed female philanthropists to direct more resources to previously marginalized causes, things like social service organizations, women's issues, children's charities, et cetera. And, uh, and just to bring back to, to the, the highlight, uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha at, How Alpha at Howard, uh, they just continue to be uh, a, a great influencer in this space. So with the knowledge in today's landscape and the ways women are able to contribute more than ever before, we can really, with a lot of confidence, state that engaging women is imperative. Uh, but how to engage them may start by first better understanding what motivates women to give and how those motiva motivations may differ from men. Let's start with an overview. Um, driven by their belief in their ability to make a positive impact, uh, getting back to that strong sense of empowerment and belief in the charitable work and creating positive social change. So um, that leads to being motivated to elevate philanthropy for nonprofit sectors that maybe were previously undervalued by male donors. Uh, things like uh, hunger, access to basic health services, shelter, uh, and things like that. Uh, the, the, 19, the 2021 Fidelity Charitable Women in Giving report reflected that the most commonly cited motivation for women to give is because, quote, the need is so great and they want to make a difference, reflect, reflecting an empathetic, heart-based approach to philanthropy. In fact, 64% of women said that their hearts led their way in, in making decisions about what organizations to support. And, you know, th there are a couple of, uh, of very well-known male philanthropists, and I won't, I won't name them by name, but in studying the way they give, maybe differently than what motivates women to give, uh, these two I have in mind tend to give to more bricks and mortar, fixing things quickly, uh, give me a problem to solve and I'll solve it. Uh, and one person who has knowledge of one of these people's thought process is they almost approach it like a menu. Like what else you got for me? You know, they agree to something and then what else you got for me? While, while women take a, a different approach to that, uh, more longitudinal and more, uh, more widely impactful. So we, we can go back to that other slide, probably had a couple more points worth making on there. Uh, in terms of philanthropic responsibility, women often feel a sense of duties to, to support their communities, uh, driven by traditional gender roles that emphasize nurturing and caring behaviors from a, from a very young age. Uh, leadership and impact, many, many women are motivated by the opportunity to be recognized as influential leaders in both community and business settings. Uh, child cycle influence, women's charity giving patterns often align with life stages related to their children, such as alumni donations. Family and personal connections, women frequently base these charitable decisions on personal experiences, family connections, or public knowledge about the organization. And finally, political and social causes. In high net worth households, women are off, often drawn to philanthropy that supports political or social causes. Which leads us to these three remarkable women philanthropists. Uh, and I've been privileged enough through client work to get to meet all, all three of these. On the left is, is Roxanne Quimby. Uh, she made the largest uh, gift to the National Park Foundation's uh, campaign that supported the Park Service's uh, centennial in 2016. Uh, she gave a huge amount of property in Northern Maine to become, become Cantaden National Park. Uh, and uh, you see from her quote, some of the things that motivated her. Uh, Linda Dimmer has been a big supporter of a lot of causes, but the one highlighted here is the National Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, she has a strong belief in its mission of conservation uh, while promoting uh, a healthy outdoor lifestyle as well. And then finally, Dana Dornsife has, has supported a, a number of causes uh, over time, a very, very powerful and influential woman uh, in philanthropy. But if you look at these quotes and think about everything we've, we've talked about already, the common threads are the familial experiences, the trust in the organization, 
a sense of responsibility to support those in need and supporting organizations that align with their personal values. So with these things in mind, I'm gonna call on Jan now to lead us across the finish line and share some recommendations about how you can apply these things that we've talked about into, into your work, Jan. Thank you, Dennis. So all of this information is really interesting and really valuable, but we got to the so what. How do we take this and really use it to harness the activity and the work that we're doing day in and day out? So we're in the midst of another sea change. Uh, certainly, uh, Mackenzie Scott and Melinda French Gates have, have really been the, the poster children for that sea change. But what they're doing is, as Dennis mentioned, it's this new focus on trust-based philanthropy. It's less about the grant reporting and the metrics that you come back with, but more about the messaging around the vision and empowering the philanthropist to have so much trust in the organization and so much commitment to what's being done that it, it's given with fewer strings attached because there's a, a belief that the values align. And so how do we uh, do that as well. How do we communicate and build those kinds of trust relationships um, with, with our donors, our current donors and our new donors? And as Dennis mentioned, giving circles is a key part of all of this. And I'd like to challenge us not just to look at the circle itself and harnessing that, but then how do we use our donor uh, data information and AI to look at, to pull those circles apart? and look at who's in those circles and how do we pull out key folks who might not only give through the circle, but we might engage individually. And how do we better harness that engagement, not just collectively, but individually? Um, I think you are gonna to start to see a lot of uh, more women follow in Mackenzie Scott and Melinda French Gates footprints of um, really building on trust and engagement and less about uh, metrics and reporting. So we've come up with 10 ways that we think we can all use this information to, to better engage women. And uh, hopefully you all will each come up with 10 more. But let's start with creating opportunities. Um, we need to, as, as professionals, move past the days of we engage women on our event committees and our boards. That's a great way to engage women, but we need to think more strategically and more creatively. How do we create, for example, women's donor advisory groups um, that can help us craft and understand our women donors better? Let's go and involve women in advisory capacities to help us do this work and to help us better formulate what our strategy and our messaging is going to be to our women donors. Um, personalizing communication, obviously goes, and that goes with all donors, right? It, it's not just for women, but when it comes to attracting women's donors, you know, how do we tell more women's stories? How do we feature our women leaders within our own organizations more prominently so that, uh, women donors of all types can see uh, the very female um, celebrated culture within our own organizations. Again, it's back to that Mackenzie Scott and Melinda French Gates building trust in the organization and showing that our values and their values align with one another. Um, avoiding the gender bias. We all do it. We do it all the time. We don't do it intentionally, but we do it. So really looking back at your database, your salutations, how you address folks. Um, I'm gonna tell a story, very true story. Um, when I was chief development officer for a health system, one of my uh, best donor couples, uh, he was a graduate of a male, originally male, all male higher education uh, school that had gone co-ed, but it still had very much a male culture. He was a low level donor to the school for many, many years. And they then had a big campaign and it inspired him and his wife. And they had a long conversation. The two of them together met with the giving officer and decided to make for them going from a thousand or twenty five hundred dollars a year to a hundred thousand dollar gift, a six figure gift. Big jump. Great opportunity for the institution. 
They sent the check in. It was from their joint account. It was a letter from both of them, thank you know, thanking them for the time for the giving officer and and proudly making the gift. You guessed it. The le- the acknowledgement letter came addressed to him and him alone. Understand that's what's in the database. But we need to we need to clean up our databases, right? We need to think more thoughtfully and more broadly into how we've got some built-in gender biases in our own information. And how do we go in and and do really significant, whether we do it ourselves or we bring in a consultant partner, how do we clean up our data donor databases to avoid these gender biases? Um, four, you know, obviously build relationships. Again, it goes to all for all donors but but how are we going beyond giving officer meetings and and events and those types of things how are we really digging in um we use uh, a, a program for our clients called engage dx whatever tool you want to use how do you survey your donors whether that's in small focus groups whether it's donor engagement surveys of different types how do you really start getting in to build that relationship in a meaningful way that is, um, you you want it standard enough that it's operationally feasible, but how do we break out of it being so by rote that we're missing opportunities to strengthen those relationships? Um, Highlighting impact. Look at your communications really critically. I would venture to guess for most of us, uh, when we feature our donor stories, probably a majority of them are men and or they are couples. So how are we going to change that narrative a little bit with how we report about giving and how we report about folks who um, support our organizations? Um, what about single women, women of color, women of various um, who have various gender identity? How do we celebrate them? really put them front and center and show that we are an organization, again, whose values match their values, whose values understand women of all type and celebrate women of all types and recognize what they bring to our respective organizations. So little homework, go back, look at your last five annual reports and donor newsletters and 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 say to ourselves, how do we do better in celebrating women in the stories that we tell. Uh, understanding motivations, and Dennis, you know, really, really touched on this. I do think we use the research and we use our own experience and, and we do, again, make ex- assumptions, right? Um, a lot of times we assume a woman is going to want to contribute to female related causes. Many times that might be the case. But think about this scenario where you have a mother whose young son was tremendously impacted by his first male elementary school teacher and how a male being in the classroom changed the course of that child's education. Imagine that mother's interest in learning about an initiative in a place of higher education to bring more men into elementary school education, right? A a different, not a female related cause, but something that touched her as a woman and as a mother. Imagine a woman whose father passed from prostate cancer. Again, not a female issue, but something that's near and dear to her heart and something that she might want to invest in education and screening for early prostate cancer detection. So it, it's good to recognize that women do want to support other women and to support women causes, but we need to make sure that the pendulum doesn't swing too far, right? And that we still continue to ask those one-on-one questions about what, what matters to you as a mother, as a single person, as a daughter, as whatever role that you play, what matters to you in the work that our organization is doing. Uh, networking opportunities. So, you know, giving out circles have proven women value congregating. They value the camaraderie. They value uh, the power of them being together. 
But now, since the 70s and 80s and beyond, while more and more women are in the workplace, there's a professional networking component here, right? There is an opportunity to win for smart and powerful and um, achieving women to meet other smart, powerful, achieving win women. I'm going to challenge you, don't sit on the sidelines, right? We all sit there and we have these wonderful giving circles or networking groups um, that support our efforts and that we have great relationships with. That's fabulous. But why don't we create our own? Don't sit on the sidelines. Think about the work that you're doing and how can you be a convener? How can you be a source that provides the networking, especially for younger women in the workforce? Because then they start to see you as a valued partner and they want to be a valued partner in return. Um, leveraging social causes. Uh, you know, look, the data shows women do um, more than men are inspired by social causes. And, and certainly the last 10 years um, pre-COVID and during COVID and post-COVID have shown us there are a lot of very significant social issues out there um, that are very front and center. How do you look at the work that your organization is doing and tie it to social issues that matter and will matter to women in your community? And then how do you communicate that and really do so in a meaningful and engaging way? Um, also think about engaging the families. For women who are mothers, mothers love to do things with their families, celebrate their families, involve their families in what they do. So as you have women board members or women volunteers or women donors, what opportunities are you providing for them to engage their daughters and or their mothers in the work that they're doing in their organization? And it might be educational opportunities. It might be um, a mother-daughter tea that is held and, and brings in, it encourages folks to bring toys for children in the pediatrics unit whatever it might be, but how knowing that mothers get more involved when their families are involved, how can you look at their involvement in a broader, more creative uh, manner? Um, also, uh, think about, um, might sound silly, but little things, right? Lemonade stands. How do mothers start to get their, their children involved in lemonade stands and teaching philanthropy at an early age? How do you make philanthropy a family affair in a meaningful and fun and engaging way? Because I can promise you, the more that you engage the entire family unit, the more engaged and the more philanthropic that, that family is going to be and that individual is going to be. Um, and then finally, look at women at every generation. We tend to focus on the 40 plus women, right? Because we all say the same thing. Oh, well, under that age, you've got um, maybe private school tuitions and camps and all of those expenses that you have when you have younger children. So meaningful and larger gifts don't happen until post 40. I I'm going to ask you to challenge that notion because we are not just trying to hit our, our annual and campaign goals for today and for this year. But we're also sowing the seeds for next year and the next campaign and the folks will follow in our footsteps. So I will venture to guess for those of you who are not higher education, many of you are located in areas where there is a college or a university nearby. And many of you may benefit from those sororities because sororities really um, do a wonderful job in teaching the, the importance of philanthropy and giving back. So I would venture to guess many of you have received the $2,000 big check that we all hold up from a dance -thon or a car wash or some sorority initiatives, and it might be for Breast Cancer Month or um, for a women's shelter or whatever it might be. And that's wonderful. Those, th those gifts are, are meaningful and joyous to celebrate. But I'm going to challenge you to collect the name of every girl in that sorority who participated in that event and put her on your annual fund list. You may not get anything for a while. Um, our guess is somewhere between 20 to 25% might turn into donors um, and stay local. Um, and it may be $10 a, month, a year is all you're going to get for a long time, right? They do it because they feel good about it. And they like the fact that you think they're important and that you've recognized them 
and even gauge them when everybody else thinks of them as, you know, they're just these college students who go out and have fun and do these dance thons Put them on your annual giving list. Involve them in what you're doing. Take that $10 a year because that young woman's going to go out and get a job. And she's going to start becoming a, a successful wage earner. And she's going to remember the folks who early on thought she was important and who she took the time to think was important. And then I'll challenge all my higher ed friends out there in the audience. We, you know, it's your sororities that are out there doing this work and, and doing great things in their community. How can you tap into that? Not taking away from the other nonprofits, but engaging them um, with, uh, you know, as alumni donors and getting them to start thinking of you as the end, not instead of what they're doing for the local community, because you want them to do that. That makes them good citizens. But how do you also start to engage them? Do you send them a, a, a note of congratulations on the great fundraiser they did? And talk to them about some of the work you're doing within the university to celebrate women's education and advancement um, of women's education. So start to, to mine your own field in that way. And, and don't discount those young donors because they're your, they're your major donors in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so those are sort of some, some ideas that we've had. Uh, I hope that I'm sure you, as you go back with your colleagues and maybe look back at this um, webinar with them, will come up with your own ideas. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get some follow-up materials from this. Um, one of them is this really wonderful um, uh, DEI paper, uh, Kara, if you can advance, um, on... Um, that we're gonna send to you. And it really is about looking into your database. Um, we do a lot of work with clients uh, on database mining and engagement. And it, it's so important, however you do it and whomever you do it with, there is so much information in your database that you have likely not tapped into. Start to slice and dice your data in different ways. Start to really look critically on how you pull your data and how you use that data to engage donors, how you use that data to um, bring folks in uh, through activities that you're doing, through stewardship, through surveys. Um, so I, I think this article will be um, really interesting and, uh, for all of you. Um, we're gonna go and, and do some questions. Um, and I also wanna tell you, if you have enjoyed what we're doing today, we are doing these webinars at least once a month. Um, they're free and we'd love to have you be a part of them. All different kinds of topics related to the work that we do. And um, we'll send you a link following this webinar to the link that has the uh, webinar list schedule so that we hope you'll, you'll join us in the future. Um, so let's start with some questions. And I see there are a few in uh, Q&A. Um, Jan, yes. Jan I'd, like, I'd like to take a stab at the one that, that are, why are women underrepresented on boards and in leadership positions? Please so, do. Jump on in, my friend. You know, I, I say, I would say the, the short answer is because organizations aren't trying hard enough. Uh, you know, board development is a contact sport. Uh, and, you know, in the literal and figurative sense. And I'm still shocked by the number of organizations that I encounter that either don't have term limits on their, on their, in their bylaws, or if they are in there, they aren't enforcing them. And so it, it leads to some sort of a complacency or laziness, if you will, and not turning those over and bringing in some, some new and fresh ideas. Many of those could be women. So if you're if you have influence in an organization around the governance committee or the or the or the board committee, uh, that is the group that really needs to be addressing the pipe building the pipeline of people that that should include women. But it, it could also address other other uh, diverse board types of assets. And the same holds true with with leadership. It you just have to, organizations just have to try harder. And if they're working with, say, a search firm to to identify a pool of candidates for leadership positions. They need to stress that that's important to build a, a diverse pool, including women with uh, with whoever they're working with on that. So that would be my response to that. 
think that's a great point, Dennis. And I will also say we as professionals tend to stop short. So we see this man who owns a company or is a large, um, very philanthropic in the community and a very um, significant community leader. And so we identify him as the person when we want on our board and we stop short. And if we keep digging, we might find that she's actually equally involved in the community. She has a different but equally impressive job or, or sphere of influence. So I think we see because the men in our communities are more visible as leaders, we assume that they're the force that are gonna make the impact on our organization. And many of them will, but I challenge you, the CEO of the company is gonna be maybe too busy to be a really engaged active board member, but his spouse might be a wonderful board member because that person might have more time, equal capacity, because they share the capacity and and equal or more interest in, in what you're doing. Um, let's go I to the next. Oh, go actually, ahead. I want to add one point to that as well, because I think this is something that can be a real actionable solution to this issue. And it is when we think about the, the nomination process for nominating new board members, we rely on our existing board members. So as Jan had suggested, you know, really looking into see what your demographics already are. But as you look at those female board members, really encouraging them to seek out other females in their network, because as the males on your board may be doing, they're reaching out to their male counterparts as well. And so ensuring that those who are already on your board are your very best advocates for bringing on more diversity it can be a real actionable way for you to increase that diversity. Thanks, Kara. So there was a question about engaging younger donors. I think we, we talked a little bit about that, about young women through sororities and creating networking opportunities for them. A lot of these young 25 um, to 40 year old women, they're smart, they're capable. They have capacity. It may not be a six-figure gift, may not even be a five-figure gift, but they have capacity to really participate in your organization in a meaningful sort of bread and butter way, and that you can grow them. Get them before somebody else finds them. Get them early, engage them meaningfully, and keep them because they will remember who thought they were important and who took the time to get to know them when they weren't five and six and seven figure gifts. Um, um, I wanna add one more item to that as well, because the research has really reinforced that those younger generations, not only do they value being able to volunteer with an organization at a time when they might not be able to get quite as much treasure, but the research shows that not only is it a desire, it is now something that it is an expectation that the younger donors are able to volunteer first. Jan had mentioned the importance of building trust. Well, if you think about what the last five to 10 years have looked like, and really thinking about how the younger generations might be impacted by economic landscape or even some stories where maybe something has gone wrong in philanthropy, there is an actual distrust from some of the younger generation. And calling that out isn't a negative, but it really goes back to how can you identify what is meaningful and a desire versus an actual expectation? And by looking at not only those that are already volunteering, but creating new volunteer roles and ways for them to be engaged with your organization to build that trust, it's even more than just let's build this while they're building their wealth. No matter what, if you do not have that exposure with the organization from a younger generation standpoint, they may not consider you because you did not provide that, let alone as a cherry on top. It is the actual necessity behind it. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. There was a question about knowing the motivations of why women give. How do you adjust your marketing and communications? I would highly suggest that you um, 
create a women's advisory communications committee and you bring women in to help you with your messaging. You bring them in for a tour of your organization. You bring them in and show them the work you're doing and then ask them, how can we best communicate this? We want women to see the important work we're doing. We want them. We want women like you involved. How can we bring them in? Bring them in when you're doing your annual report, show them a draft, get their feedback. When you're doing your newsletter, whether it's an electronic or printed newsletter, bring them in and ask for their feedback of how you're doing. Ask them to look back at some of your previous communications and critique them and be honest and say, how can we better highlight women, engage women in how we're communicating our work? So I strongly recommend a, a women's advisory communications group. Um, I, I've, I've done it and it's been incredibly um, effective. And, and women, because they tend to be nurturing, really give good, honest feedback because that is that is our way, right? That's how we do it. Um, any but other thoughts, Dennis? Yeah, but if if, if yeah. you're trying to establish something like that or say your own women's giving circle or something like that, the quickest way to make it make sure that it fails is to bring this group in and say, here's what we want you to do. Uh, I have a client that that started one and they got really good advice from uh, the Women's Philanthropy Institute. And one of the pieces of advice was uh, let the group decide where they want to go, what things they want to focus on and set realistic uh, targets from, from, uh, from the very beginning. I saw a comment in the chat about um, young donor societies. I'm a big believer in, in young donor societies. Um, again, even if they each contribute $500 or $1,000 a year, you're, you're getting a hold of them before anybody else does because they are going to grow and they are going to grow as donors. Um, but I think the other way is start to read your local paper and or look at if you're a higher education, look at your alumni news um of of your younger graduates what are they doing and how are they doing it and reach out to them and say you're the type of emerging leader our organization needs come out and see what we're doing come get to know us be really intentional about how you prospect younger donors your local paper will have it um local blogs social media posts you'll see who the young up-and-comers are in your community if you're a local organization or in your alumni roles if you are um, a, a higher ed uh, university um, or if you were in um, a sector like environmental that has big national foot imprint start to look at the newsletters and start to read who are these young up-and-comers and, and be intentional about reaching out to them engaging them giving them a tour Say, how do we get somebody like you? Because you're the kind of person who's our leader for tomorrow. And you know, something really important that you just said, Jan, is in that transparency. And often we might be working with donors and we may not necessarily think that we should share our plan, our thought. You know, we're really kind of trying to keep it behind the curtain. And especially for younger generations to do just what Jan said to actually say the words, this is intentionally what we want to accomplish, help us get there. And again, sometimes that transparency, while I know all of you value it, we may not understand just how much it is valued by the younger generations, that that automatically will build the trust and really help you build that army that is able to go out there and be your best advocates because them being your advocate that is actually them. That's their own volunteerism. That is the way that they also can give back. So really that transparency, such a key point, Jan. And then somebody in the chat mentioned um, plan giving. Um, plan giving is such a joy, right? We've all had the, the days where we open the envelope uh, uh, in the mail and it's just one, uh, an ordinary day until you see it's from a, an estate attorney and, and you've been gifted this wonderful gift that you didn't know was coming. Um, plan giving is such an important tool in our toolkit. And, and I do think women think differently about legacies. Um, I think the research shows that. I know 
our, our experiences uh, individually and as a firm have seen that. So think about how you talk about plan giving and knowing life expectancy for women is longer than men. Think about that plan giving discussion. Men tend to like things that, that are monuments, right? Bricks and mortar. Women tend to like ripple effect, impact, long lasting programmatic um, uh, impact. And so think about your planned giving strategies and your planned giving discussions. How are you speaking to, if it's a couple, asking both of them individually and together, what are the legacies that you wanna lead? Make sure you really include the spouse in that conversation. And I will say to you, when you are looking at giving power, um, LGBTQIA women, when you look at a, a, a demographic that has high wealth, high intelligence, and in, in many cases, not necessarily heirs um, or if, uh, that they're passing their wealth down to, think about the impact of these women. They're smart. They are rising in the corporate world and they um, are philanthropically extremely capable. So think about ways to engage LBTQIA women because they are a powerhouse. They can make great things happen for your organization and, and really a group that I think many of us um, have not um, embraced and celebrated the way we can and should. So I think, oh, one more, uh, women's influence and development of uh, foundation funding and organizations. I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we weren't talking about DAS, donor advised funds, nearly the way we do now. I think that is um, a, a, an aspect of, of female, women having more say in how money is given and, and DAF, I think makes it more of a family gift and, and two people um, influencing that gift. And the same thing with foundations. I think that is why foundations are becoming so strong because it's not just men making the decisions now. It, it, is, it is a collective decision. And I think you see that in DAFs and foundations. So uh, we wanna be respective of every, respectful of uh, everybody's time. Uh, we can't tell you how much we appreciate the time you've spent with us. Again, you will get all of our contact information. There's the QR code if you want to do feedback now. Um, you will also, in the, the slides and, and things that you get, you will see our individual email addresses. Please reach out to us at any time. Um, we are here to answer questions, talk to you, uh, love to hear what you all are thinking and doing and, and sharing information. And we wish you the best of everything. Enjoy what's left of the summer. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.